I, uh, okay, so we're on to the section two of key area three of unit two of higher human biology. Um, last video we looked at actual what is fertility. Now we're going to look at fertility techniques to help someone get pregnant if they are struggling. So uh, in terms of treatment of infertility, so first of all, around 34% of Scots suffer That's fertility problems statistic. at some point in their life. So a lot of people will. Chances are a lot of the people watching this at some point in their life, if they decide to have babies, will go through this problem. It is quite common. Uh, there's a lot of things doctors will actually recommend before giving you any of the expensive proper treatments. Uh, we're going to touch on each of them. Uh, the first one, kind of common sense, time. Just give it a bit more time. Try it a bit more. And then you never know what might happen. They usually wait a year or so of you actually trying before they say, wait, there might be an issue. Um, obviously, lifestyle and fertile period counselling, which again, we'll talk about all of these more, but just looking at, are you actually trying to get pregnant at the right time? And what can you do to improve your chances at that time? Hormonal treatment being a big one, artificial insemination and IVF. So we're going to touch on each of these as we go through this video. The last three are most likely to come up in exam type questions mm -hmm. of uh, name this, describe this. Here's a picture of this. Give us details on it. OK, so time. Many people can be really impatient if they're not pregnant after a couple of months. Now, if you think about it. After six months, you have literally just had six shots at going for an ova. OK, the chances of an ova being fertilized are really, really low anyway. Um, but doctors would advise trying for at least six months before seeking med medical advice, unless the woman is quite old. If the woman's quite old, they might accelerate things very slightly. They might also try to give advice about the timing of the woman's fertile period, because obviously if the couple is having sex at the wrong time in the female cycle, there's very little chance a pregnancy must occur. So actually saying here's the dates, the actual dates where you should be having sex might help. There's lots of home based guidance to assist uh, families for whether they're ovulating. So I know these look like pregnancy tests, but these are ovulation tests. So they are doing things like detecting levels of LH. Remember that one that causes ovulation. Uh, there's also some that come with a thermometer to detect that 0 0.5 degree increase in temperature that occurs around ovulation. Okay. Uh, another method is obviously the lifestyle and fertile period counselling. So a doc this is when a doctor might actually consult the couple and the female specifically about her menstrual cycle and say, right, when is it actually happening and trying to pinpoint exactly the best times to be having sex to try and have a baby. They will also ask about lifestyle things. So trying to find ways to reduce things that increase for infertility. So looking at ways to reduce stress, looking at maybe how much you're exercising and increasing that, stopping things like smoking and drugs and alcohol and various different things, anything to make sure your hormone levels are as normal as possible to be fertile, basically. Right, depending on the age of the woman or maybe they've been trying for a while, this is when treatments will start. So one possible option of treatment is hormonal treatment. So this will be done to the female, even if it's the male who has low fertility. So even if the male is low fertile or maybe the female is low fertile, the female can be offered hormonal treatment to boost the number of ova she produces. Remember, it's usually only one per month. But if you're releasing, say, maybe eight or nine per month, that's eight or nine every month extra chances. Now, you need to know the things that these drugs either do. So they can either mimic FSH or LH. So if they're mimicking FSH, you get many follicles produced, meaning you can have more ova. Or what they can do is they can prevent the negative feedback effect of oestrogen. So remember, oestrogen high levels inhibit FSH. What these drugs do is they stop that inhibition from happening, meaning that FSH is continually released by the pituitary, meaning again, more ova, more chances to get pregnant. Now, the downside of this is if you are producing a lot of ova, there is a much higher chance of fertilization occurring. And in that turn, a lot more chances of babies happening because something called super ovulation occurs. So just when you are producing way more eggs than usual. And obviously this means you could end up with four or five, six babies happening because if you've got a lot of ova to be fertilized and each one that gets fertilized, you're going to be having a lot of babies. But obviously this comes with many flaws as more children means more risk to babies and mum as well. So higher chances of any kind of fatality in the babies or the mother uh, obviously goes up massively with each increased baby number that there is. Okay, second option is artificial insemination. So we're getting more and more severe kind of in the options as we go. So if the male has a sperm count of less than 20 million uh, 
sperm per centimeter cubed of semen, artificial semination may be considered because the male is considered to have a low sperm count. Okay, what it does is it basically gives the sperm a little assist on getting past the barriers of the cervix and the uterus, or a lot of the uterus. So it bypasses the barrier of the vagina and cervix and ensures that healthy sperm are used. Okay, what this process also means is that donor sperm can be used without the female having sex with that person if they if they don't want to. So say you've got maybe uh, a lesbian couple who needs some sperm and want to get pregnant, is that artificial insemination can be used for that couple, or maybe just a, a single female who wants to have children, is that they can again go to a donor clinic, pick up some donor sperm, and um, use artificial insemination to fertilize any ova that she has and then have a child without the need for a male partner to be present or involved in the process. We'll keep going with it. Oh, okay. uh, so what happens is this sperm samples are correct, collected over a period of a few days. So the idea is it's not just one single dose because the male will have low sperm count. They need to take several doses of it to try and get as many sperm as possible. And then the sperm are washed and that's in inverted commas because we don't mean they're run under a tap. Uh, they are basically filtered out to select the best ones. So the ones with one head, one tail looking right and all that kind of thing. And then using a fine catheter, so it's kind of, it's not a needle because the catheter is basically like a very fine tube. Um, the sperm are inserted directly into the uterus. So that goes up through the vagina, past the cervix, directly into the uterus. And this means you can insert, you know, a few hundred sperm into the uterus where there might only be 20 normally. And this means that there's a higher chance of them swimming up the oviduct to fertilize the uh female ova. Remember, this must be done during ovulation as well. If this is not done during the ovulatory period, you just wasted the sperm. And so this, again, if you want to see the links to this properly, you can go onto the Sway to see them. Um, but we're going to talk about IVF now and the proper process of IVF. So IVF stands for in vitro fertilization, which means this is fertilization that happens outside of the body, so not in the body, out with the body. Um, and this is a picture of the person who is a baby of the first IVF. She is. She's the first IVF baby ever. And I think her name's Louise Brown. Um, and she's she's either 30 or 40, 35 or 40 years old uh, coming up to that. This so has been so happening been, for a while. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, she was very, very famous for a while for being, they used to call them test tube babies, uh, but it's now quite a common process. So uh, in terms of the IVF process, there is four steps that we go through in this kind of, yeah. So the first one is the idea that the female is given fertility drugs to stimulate the growth of many follicles, because obviously having a follicle to be there to release an ova is the biggest part of it, because we need the ova. Uh, these are then scanned using ultrasound to check if they are mature. If they are ready, the ova is removed using a hollow needle, because again, remember, this is happening out with the body, so the ova needs to be out with the body. Okay, what happens at the same time slash next, the male is, if there is one, or if there's donor sperm, uh, gives several samples of sperm and the best will be selected for use. So again, ones with the right number of heads, one, the right number of tails, one, the right size of head, uh, all of that kind of thing, and good swimmers. Uh, the third part of this is that the sperm and eggs, and usually this is approximately 20 eggs, um, will be mixed together in a petri dish and hopefully this will allow fertilization to occur. Okay, the zygotes in the petri dish, so again hopefully there's about 20 of them, will be allowed to divide until they reach about eight cells. Now that number, you do need to know that number, is that the zygotes reach about eight cells. The female at the same time, whoever's going to have these ova growing inside of her, or sorry these zygotes growing inside of her, is given hormones to stimulate the growth of the endometrium, so things like oestrogen and progesterone to build up the endometrium so that there's somewhere to put and implant the zygotes into. And again, it'll be ultrasound scans that do that are done to check the thickness of the endometrium. Okay, and again, this is still part of the last process, this is still happening at the same time, is that the best two or three of these now zygotes that have grown divided into eight cells are selected and they are implanted into the uterus and the spare embryos are then frozen and they could possibly be used in future. So maybe that couple want to have another baby. They can go and be like, well, we have some frozen. Now, success rates of IVF are quite low. Uh, the more we do it as a country, as a population of Earth, the better we get at it. It used to be something like a 10% success rate. 
Um, but it depends on loads of factors, such as the age of the ova or the eggs is really important. The age of the uterus provider, so the age of the, the mother who has the uterus, if they are implanted into, say, a 45-year-old woman, is less chance of success than if they maybe used a 25-year-old surrogate, so somebody else who volunteered their womb to say, okay, you can implant your zygotes in me and I'll carry them. Uh, if you want to know how that happens, I don't watch Friends. Phoebe does it for her brother. Um, the immune system of the uterus. If you have a really aggressive immune system, they will kill the zygotes because they are foreign to the, hum the, to the mother's body um, and that won't work. Uh, stress levels as well. And this, this is the cruel one. There's a lot of couples who are undergoing IVF. They really, 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 really want this to work. They maybe only get, depending on where they live, one or two goes at this. And if it doesn't work, they might have to start paying for it. And it can be up to nine, ten thousand pounds a go. And if they have paid for it already, they really want it to work. And that can cause huge impact on stress. And that can actually reduce the chances of it being a successful process. The hormone levels in the uterus. So again, we'd be looking for lots of estrogen and progesterone. And the big one is luck. OK, now this thing here, this, this slide, it's not something you can get examined on, but it's just a sort of general human interest thing. And again, if you're interested in it more, you can click the link on the Sway and that will follow you to um, IVF and how it's improving its success rates. So in terms of IVF helping male fertility, so IVF obviously increases the chance of a successful fertil fertilization as it means that the sperm can be placed right next to the egg. Because obviously sometimes male fertility, if it's really low, the sperm aren't great at their job. They're maybe not as motile as they could be. They maybe aren't necessarily doing everything that they need to do. So if we put the sperm and the egg right beside each other, it massively reduces a huge part of their job and that they don't have to swim all the way to it. They are just put beside it and have to deal with that. Uh, and a method that is used to help with this is called ICSI, so another load of letters. Yeah, the problem with some men's sperm is that they are so bad at swimming, they can't even swim into the egg if they're placed right next to it. So they need an extra help, which is what ICSI is for. So during IVF, instead of the sperm being placed in the Petri dish, um, or normal IVF is the sperm replaced in the Petri dish, but during ICSI, which stands for, and actually knowing the name of this is actually quite helpful, it's called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Now that to me literally says what it does because anything intra means inside, like intraspecific competition for National Five was inside the species. Um, so this is saying inside the cytoplasm sperm injection. So that tells me exactly what it does. So what happens is one sperm is selected you pull out its nucleus and you directly inject the nucleus straight into the egg. So the sperm doesn't have to swim into the egg because it can't, because it's useless at swimming. Instead, you do the swimming job for it. You see, take its nucleus and you fuse its nucleus directly with the egg. Now, what this does is it increases the likelihood that the desired male sperm can be used instead of the donor. So say you do have a male who's got very, very, very low, terrible quality sperm, you can still have a child that is genetically that man's child or increases the likelihood instead of saying, right, your sperm is so terrible, we need to use a strange donor person's genetic material instead. So ICSI can be beneficial for those types of couples where the male sperm just will not swim. So in terms of selecting the best embryos, obviously this is important as well. You want to select the best things to give you the best chance of it actually happening. So only the best embryos in the Petri dish will actually be selected to be implanted because better embryo, more chance of it growing and actually becoming a zygote ba or a baby and actually becoming a real thing. Um, and it's actually now possible to check the embryos to see if they have any genetic mutations before they are implanted. So as you know, you are definitely implanting the best one. There are two techniques that we can use to do this. These are called PGS and PGD. Just to confuse you, they're really similar names. Um, this can be beneficial for couples. Say you're a couple who've got very healthy fertility, but say one of you or both of you carries a potentially very, very bad genetic mutation. They might choose to use IVF uh, deliberately, even though they could have sex and have a baby the, the usual way. They might choose to use IVF for this beneficial technique to try and avoid using embryos that have got their very bad genetic mutation inside of them. So PGS stands for pre-implantation genetic screening. Now, if you're screening something, you're just looking at an overall uh, situation. So what happens is a cell is withdrawn from the embryo. So you've got eight cells inside the embryo. You take one out. 
Now, that is not going to mean that you're going to end up with an embryo born with no brain or no heart. The stem cells don't mind how many of them are there. This is something we've found out. So you can actually take one of the cells out and all that happens is the cells continue to divide normally inside the embryo that's left over. So a cell is withdrawn from the embryo. The DNA undergoes PCR to amplify up the, the copies of the DNA so we get a big enough sample to work with. And then the idea is it's checked for general screening of any mutations that the parents might carry. So healthy embryos would then be implanted, mutated embryos would be destroyed or maybe donated to research, depending on the wishes of the parents. OK, so the idea is for screening, we're just screening for a general condition inside the embryo. And if it turns out that this cell, no, we find out this cell carries a genetic mutation, we do not use it. Whereas this cell, this cell does not carry any genetic mutations. OK, we can use embryo X or embryo 7. So PGD, so this stands for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is used to check for a specific mutation that the parents may carry. So this is when a single gene is extracted from the embryo. So sorry, a, single gene, a single cell is extracted from the embryo and the DNA is copied using PCR again to amplify and make lots of copies of it. Uh, and this is tested for that specific genetic condition. Embryos that carry this mutation will be destroyed. Healthy ones will be implanted. So it's quite similar to PGS, but not quite the same. Well, and this is the one where people get confused. PGS them. is looking at any possible genetic, common genetic condition. PGD is... I am Fred Jones and I, I carry a specific thing. genetic disorder. Please look for that specific genetic disorder. And that's what PGD is looking for. It's looking for the parents know they carry something specific. Do this, do these embryos carry that specific thing? Okay. So PGS is just generally screening saying, do we have general good health? PGD is we're looking for something very specific. Okay, now again, if you're on the Sway, you can have a look at the Sway and you can click onto this link. It's looking at advancing things that we can do with IVF, such as three person IVF is a thing now. So the idea of using uh, three different parts of different reproductive or, um, cells for people. The idea is an egg from one person, a nucleus in the egg of a second person and the sperm of a third person in order to create a baby. Okay, so summary of infertility. There was quite a lot of words in this one that you have to get your head around. Sorry about that. So uh, in terms of the types of treatment, the first one we talked about really was hormonal. Uh, this is used for female hormonal imbalances and general fertility problems. And this works by mimicking FSH and LH and it stops the inhibition of FSH by estrogen. Okay, artificial insemination is used for low sperm count or low mot motility of sperm uh, in the males. And the idea is you inject the sperm directly into the uterus. Uh, IVF is used for any kind of long term problems when you've tried and you've tried and you've tried. It's still maybe not quite happening. Uh, this works by drugs then make drugs to make. Oh, I could not read that for the life of me there. Uh, so drugs that make follicles, they collect the sperm and the eggs, they fertilize them in the petri dish and then they can implant it into a uterus. So it could have been slightly more words in those sentences to make that read nicer. OK, ICSI is used for people with low sperm count or low motility of sperm. And the sperm nucleus is injected directly into the ova nucleus and then the zygotes are implanted into the uterus. Okay. And finally, PGS and PGD, these are used for checking basically if there's any kind of genetic disease. So cells taken from the embryo and tested for specific mutations. So PDGS is the general screening, so just checking is there anything of note, whereas PGD is the more, I have this thing, please check, do, will this embryo have this thing? Okay, now you can get examined on anything in this mm. list, uh, so it's quite a big key area. You can get a nice essay on it. You can, and actually they're quite nice for essays mm. uh, for it. The next area that we're going to cover is contraception, and that'll be the final video for this key area.